Well, let's dive into our text this morning. We're going to be picking up John's gospel back in John chapter 19. We're going to be starting at the beginning of John chapter 19. And let's begin by talking about one of the most iconic scenes in American movie history. Now, the movie I'm going to talk about is iconic, but if you're looking for a family movie night, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is necessarily your choice. My wife and I watched Unsung Hero last night, the story of uh, for King and Country and Rebecca St. James. That'd be an awesome family movie for you guys to check out. But one of the most iconic family movie scenes uh, in American history is the final court case in the 1992 film, A Few Good Men. And the plot centers around two Marines who have been charged with murder. And we quickly find out that the main villain, played by Jack Nicholson, is a man named Colonel Nathan Jessup. And we realize uh, the audience knows that Colonel Jessup has ordered what's called a code red. And this is when there's a soldier that the military leadership thinks is a bit out of line. And he orders some soldiers to go and administer a pretty severe beating to this soldier. And so the, these two on trial had administered a code red and ended up killing this young man. And so these two Marines are on trial for their lives. They're defended by a military lawyer played by Tom Cruise. And their only hope in this trial is that Tom Cruise's character can get the military leader to admit that he's the one behind what had happened. So as the court trial progresses, Tom Cruise's character summons this colonel to the stand. This was a big deal because in a court-martial type case, to put this commanding officer on the stand and accuse him without any hard evidence could actually get the lawyer himself court-martialed. And so he's taking this huge risk to defend these two young men, but it it progresses as this colonel's on the stand. And well, here's the iconic scene. Uh, Tom Cruise's character says, Colonel Jessup, did you order the code red? And the judge at that point intervenes and says, you don't have to answer that question, but he does. And he says, I'll answer that question. You want answers? And the lawyer says, I want the truth. And he looks at him with his, his veins almost bulging out of his neck. And some of you remember that. He says, you can't handle the truth. And then he goes on and he says, did I order the code red? You're right. I did. And then they lead him off in handcuffs and disgrace. And that's kind of what's happening in John 19. See, in the movie... Tom Cruise's character got this man to admit the truth, even though it made him look really bad and it kind of indicted his character. It's the Jewish people in John chapter 19 who are finally going to be forced to admit the truth. This is kind of the the nadir, the bottom of the bottom of John's gospel for the Jewish people. This is when they're finally going to blurt out the truth. And we're going to see it here in this opening section of John chapter 19, when they blurt out, we have no king but Caesar. Can you imagine God's people who have claimed that God is their Lord and King throughout the whole history of their nation? And now they're saying, never mind. Caesar's our king. They finally admitted it and their words will hover and hang in the air because John is using their words as an implicit challenge to us. We'll quickly discover who their king is, but our main point this morning and what John is driving at in his gospel, our main point is a question this morning. Who is your king? That's the question that really matters. Is Jesus the king of your life? So let's unpack this story, this section of uh, John's gospel by examining Jesus's kingship from three different angles. And the first angle we're going to look at is a question of identity. Let's look at the first five verses. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. 
The soldiers also twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head and clothed him in a purple robe. And they kept coming up to him and saying, hail king of the Jews and were slapping his face. Pilate went outside again and said to them, look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know I find no grounds for charging him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, here is the man. Okay, it's been a few weeks since we've been in John's gospel. So let's kind of remind ourselves where we left off in the story. So the end of John chapter 18, they were coming up on the Passover holiday and it had been a tradition that one prisoner would get released by the Romans. It's kind of a show of good faith. And, and Pilate was saying, well, I'm gonna release a prisoner to you and I'm gonna give you a choice. Do you want the insurrectionist, violent murderer Barabbas or Jesus? This guy you drugged me at 4 a.m. that I don't think is guilty. Well, Pilate vastly underestimated how much the Jewish people hated Jesus and wanted him dead. So they had cried out, give us Barabbas. Well, now Pilate's in a, in a real tizzy. He sees where this train is going. It's barreling down the tracks toward Jesus being executed. And he's trying to do everything he can to stop what's coming. So he gets an idea. He's thinking, maybe I can mock Jesus, expose that Jesus is no rival king. And maybe with enough agony and humiliation, I can placate the Jewish people. We can be done with this charade and we can all go back home and enjoy Passover. So what does Pilate do? It says in verse one, he had him flogged. Now it's interesting that in that era, there were three levels of flogging that could be ordered by Rome. The first and least severe level of flogging was called the fustigatio. And that, that was a simple beating. It was meant as a warning, a form of punishment, but simply to try and redirect someone's behavior, like stop doing this because it hurts. And that type of beating was applied to teenagers who were involved in youth gangs, to career hooligans, and to people who accidentally started fires that caused significant destruction. The second level of flogging was called flagellatio. And this was a proper flogging. It was severe, but not fatal punishment. The third level of punishment was called the verba ratio. You could call this a scourging. This was only administered to people who were facing capital punishment. And this verba ratio was done to prepare the path for them to be killed, to kind of speed up their death. This is when they would beat someone within an inch of their lives using those studded ropes that would rip open skin and expose organs. And, and you've probably heard that Jesus underwent that flogging, but that's not what's happening here in John 19, 1. That flogging is described in Matthew and Mark and Luke as Jesus is on the way to the cross. But here, Pilate is still trying to stop things. So he orders a level one flogging the fustigatio. And the idea is, I'm going to beat him, but hopefully we can have it be enough. So let's beat him and let's humiliate him. And so there was some humiliation happening. Notice what the soldiers did to Jesus. It says that they twisted together a crown of thorns. The crown of thorns was probably made with the thorns from a date palm. And you can see that on the screen. And you're probably familiar with the idea that these thorns were jammed into Jesus's head. And a few of them may have been, but, but I don't think that was the purpose of the crown of thorns. See, on the coins that circulated around the Roman Empire in that time, the Caesar's head, the Roman emperor's head, had a crown with rays of light kind of spiking out from it. And so the idea of this crown of thorns was meant to be like, hey, you think you're Caesar? Here's your crown. It kind of looks like Caesar's crown, just like you kind of think you're Caesar. That explains the clothing. Purple was a king's color. 
Now, purple was very hard to come by. It was made from dye that was extracted from a special kind of snail, very expensive. Unlikely that the soldiers, if they actually had a purple garment, would have wasted it on Jesus. But the soldiers wore dark red tunics that almost looked purple. And so it was kind of like fake kingly apparel with a fake crown for this so-called fake king. If you ever had the opportunity to meet a Caesar in your lifetime, there was a very particular custom of how you would greet him. You would go up to the Caesar and you would get as low as you can. You would bow before him. And then you would stand up. You would hail him by acclaiming him as your Caesar, or your Lord. And then you would kiss him. You know, that, like that Eastern European thing. Have you ever traveled to Europe and people are like trying to kiss you and you're like, dude, dude, handshake, handshake. Well, that, that's, that's what they did. Well, notice how the soldiers took that idea of how to greet a Caesar and they totally did it differently in this context. They repeated the procedure. They came to Jesus and they got low before Jesus but instead of getting up and hailing him and kissing him, they got up and they mocked him and they slapped him. Mock honor for a mock king. So now humiliation complete, Pilate drags Jesus back outside before the crowd. What a pitiful sight he must have been, bloody, bruised, beaten, a shabby robe, an ugly crown. I think Pilate's point is, we showed this guy what kind of king he is. As in, he's not a king at all. And I think Pilate's hope was pretty clear. Enough. The point's been made. He's not a threat. If he was a real king with real power and authority, he wouldn't tolerate his his people wouldn't tolerate him being made fun of and scorned like this. And so he offers a statement, four simple words. Here is the man. Maybe you have a more old school translation that simply says, behold, the man. And that's what Pilate's saying. He's like, look at him, enough. But those four simple words, here is the man, carried a lot of significance that Pilate wouldn't have even known as he said them. Because those words called back to the Jewish scriptures. Two ways that this phrase called back to the Jewish scriptures that the Jewish people would have recognized. It was though God was speaking his truth through Pilate that Pilate unwittingly said, having no idea. Uh, The first allusion in Pilate's words came from 1 Samuel chapter 9. This is when Samuel, the prophet, appointed Saul as the first king of Israel. And the Lord was working in this situation. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, see those words? Here is the man, the one who is to be king. Pilate's mocking a would-be king but he actually calls back to the fact that this is how you describe Israel's king. You present him and say, here is the man. The other callback goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter one and two, the original couple was in the garden. And it's interesting that scripture introduces this couple to us as as Adam and Eve, but Adam we think of it as a proper name. But in the Hebrew scriptures, Adam isn't a proper name. Adam is just a word that means a man. And God created a man, put him in the garden. Well, then he gave a man a job. Genesis chapter one, verse 28. Be fruitful, spread across the earth, have dominion over the world. What what was Adam's job? He was to exercise God's royal authority on God's behalf. He was supposed to be like a vice regent, like God is king and Adam is serving with kingly authority under God's power. How'd that work out? 
for about five minutes, right? Until Adam decided he would usurp God's authority, take it for himself to decide what was good, what was bad, disobey what God had said. And so rebellion and ruin came into the human story because of the wretched decision of that first man. But there was a promise in the midst of all the judgment and fallout because of Adam's sin. And Adam was judged and his wife Eve was judged and the serpent was judged. But as God was doling out judgment in Genesis chapter three, verse 15, he slipped in a promise. And he said, one of your offspring will undo all of this. The serpent will strike his heel but that offspring will crush his head. A man is coming. And if you read the Old Testament and you didn't know the rest of the story, like if you just picked up the Old Testament for the first time and started in Genesis and began reading straight through, the question you'd be asking any time a new hero got introduced would be, is this the man? Is this the one who was promised? Is this the one who was promised? And your hopes would be dashed. Is Noah the man? No. Is David the man? No. Is Moses the man? No. Is Daniel the man? No. And the Old Testament ends and there is no man. And Pilate stands up and says, here is the man. This is the new Adam, the second Adam, who would fulfill the promise spoken long ago that a new man would come, who would undo the curse, who would remove the stain of sin, who would restore God's relationship with humanity. This is the question of identity. And Pilate answers it without even knowing it. Who is this Jesus? He is the man who would be king who would restore the kingship of humanity that was gifted in the garden, but lost because of sin. There's two other questions to be addressed, two other aspects of this story. Next, let's look at a question of authority. Starting in verse six, when the chief priests and the temple servants saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify, and Pilate's gambit to bring Jesus out and get them to call things off. Clearly didn't work. Pilate responded, take him and crucify him yourselves since I find no grounds for charging him. We have a law, the Jews replied. And according to that law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was more afraid than ever. He went back into the headquarters and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus didn't give him an answer. So Pilate said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? You would have no authority over me at all, Jesus answered him, if it hadn't been given to you from above. This is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. So Pilate is rather harsh in his reply. The Jewish people are like, yeah, 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 forget that. Just crucify him. And Pilate's like, okay, here's the deal. You asked me to have a trial. I had a trial. I rendered a verdict. I said, he's not guilty. You still want to kill the guy? You go kill the guy. And they're like, you know, we can't kill him, Pilate. Like in in our laws, only Rome can execute people. And then they finally tell Pilate what they're really thinking. Now, now, the Jews are getting totally exposed here, right? Like for, for all the time that they've come to Pilate at 4 a.m. presenting Jesus, they've had one tactic and you can tell they've all agreed on it. Like, here's what we're gonna say. We're gonna say that this is an insurrectionist. He's trying to spark a rebellion against Rome. We're gonna get him to kill Jesus because he's an insurrectionist. And Pilate's like, he's not an insurrectionist. Look at him, no power. So then they're like, okay, fine. Here's the deal. He broke Old Testament law. Can you kill him because he broke Old Testament law? Would you please enforce our law for us? You're like, okay, well, what law are they referring to? Well, Leviticus 24, 16 is what was on their mind. Leviticus 24, 16 says, whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord must be put to death. 
the whole community is to stone him. If he blasphemes the name, he's to be put to death, whether the resident alien or the native. Like if you claim to be God and you're not God, you get stoned. So like, we wanna stone him. We can't really stone him. Get him on a tree, kill him. Well, now Pilate knows what they're really thinking, but this actually didn't have the desired effect. This is kind of funny. They're like, he claimed to be God. And they forgot the fact that Pilate was a Roman polytheist who worshiped a whole bunch of gods and knew about a whole bunch of demigods. Yeah, so, so let's do a quick little uh, Greek mythology thing here. Like, do you remember the name Hercules, like super strong dude? And, and Hercules was the son of Zeus, who was like the main god of the Greek pantheon, and a, a human woman that he conce- uh, that, uh, conceived Hercules with Zeus. And so Hercules had all of this power because he was half human, half God. And so Romans knew of these God-like people. So when he hears Jesus claim to be God, the first thing he thinks is, is he Hercules? I just beat him and mock him spit on him, made fun of him. This isn't going to end well if dude's Hercules. So he hightails it back inside. And he just like, back that truck up. And he goes back to Jesus, where are you from? And he, he's, he's not asking for a resume at this point. He's not like, what's your hometown and your graduating class in the high school where you, where you finished school. He's like, are you a God? And Jesus is just totally done with Pilate at this point. Because Jesus knew Pilate's heart, right? And back in chapter 18, remember Pilate had just been like, what's truth? So Jesus knew that Pilate had no heart for repenting and believing in Christ. And, and so Jesus said, I'm done telling you this, the, the things you need to know. Like you, you're, you're clearly a person who doesn't care. So Jesus is just chilling. So Pilate's like asking him all these questions. Jesus just standing there. And so this gets Pilate really riled up because Pilate's one of those guys, like, have you ever met somebody that has a position, but nobody really likes them or, or, or follows them? And so they're appealing to their position, but you know, if you've had any type of authority, the moment you have to appeal to your position of authority, it shows that you actually have nothing. And that's what Pilate's doing here. So Jesus is just like, do, 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 do. And Pilate's getting like red in the face. And he's like, don't you know who I am? I can kill you. I can let you go. And she's just like, bro, you'd have nothing if it wasn't given to you from above. Now, can I nerd out on the Greek grammar for just a second here? I think this is really interesting. It looks like when you read verse 11, it says you would have no authority if it hadn't been given to you from above. So that it looks like it's talking about authority, right? You would have no authority if authority hadn't been, but see, Greek's one of those languages that has case endings. And so we look at the case ending of the word it, and it actually doesn't line up with the case of the word authority. And so it's more likely that what Jesus is saying here is not just that you wouldn't have authority, but this whole situation has been given to you from above. All of it, every historical detail has been put in place by God. And then I find this fascinating. Jesus is on trial. Jesus is the one about whom the verdict will be rendered. But in verse 11, what does Jesus do? He renders a verdict. He becomes the judge. And he says, the one who handed me over is guilty of a greater sin. Who's he talking about? Is he talking about Judas? Is he talking about the Jewish leadership? Is he talking about Caiaphas, the high priest? The text doesn't tell us, but I think we can infer from the text. I mean, Judas betrayed Jesus and then totally drops off the scene in John's gospel. So I don't think Judas is still in mind here. Like this section of the text is building toward that climactic statement of rejecting God as king that the Jews are about to utter. So I think it's the high priest and the Jewish leaders who are in view here. And Jesus is like, they should have known. They didn't know. And it's not because they couldn't know, it's because their hearts were hard. They're guilty of a greater sin. 
Now, sideline for just a moment. It's commonplace in evangelical Christian circles to say things like, all sin is the same. Every sin is bad. I think this verse helps us think a little more carefully about that. All sin is rebellion against God. All sin deserves God's judgment, but not all sin is the same in severity. And so therefore not all sin deserves the same scope of judgment. Let me give you an example from the New Testament later where some sin is given a greater punishment than other sin. Uh, Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 2, speaking of false teachers who infiltrate the church, he's like, these people are springs without water, mist driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. The worst of the worst punishment. I think that's comforting. Because it's hard for me to wrap my mind around the fact that the little white lie a child tells and the Holocaust deserve the same punishment. Are they both sins? Yes. Do they both offend God? Yes. Do they both need the blood of Jesus? Yes. But without the intervention of the blood of Christ, there is a ranking of the severity of sins that God himself knows and oversees. And in his justice, he judges sins to the severity that they each deserve. We have a good God. And Jesus shows us that as he claims authority back from Pilate. So we've had a question of identity. We've had a question of authority. Let's finish up with a question of allegiance. Verse 12. From that moment, Pilate kept trying to release Jesus, but the Jews shouted, if you release this man, you're not Caesar's friend. Anyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside. He sat down on the judge's seat in a place called the Stone Pavement in Aramaic, Gabbatha. It was the preparation day for the Passover. It was about noon. And then he told the Jews, here's your king. They shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Then he handed him over to be crucified. So the Jews, I mean, their tactics just keep blowing up in their face, right? Like he's an insurrectionist. No, he's not. Enforce our laws. Nah. So finally, they turn up the political pressure here. And the key phrase is, you're not a friend of Caesar. Here's the deal. Annas, remember him? He was the high priest, the, the, like the godfather, the power behind the power, Caiaphas' father-in-law. And then Caiaphas, who was presently serving as high priest at the time. Like these two men were politically connected. They knew how things worked. And so when they said, you're not a friend of Caesar, what they're really saying is, if you don't do what we want, we're going to go tattle on you to Caesar, to the emperor, Tiberius at the time. And you got to understand that Pilate was in a precarious political position. Like you think of Pilate and he's like, I've got all this authority. Well, let's talk about how much authority Pilate really had. So when Pilate first became governor of Judea, the first big decision that he made was that the Roman troops who normally were stationed in Caesarea would spend the winter in Jerusalem. Now, usually the soldiers only came to Jerusalem for crowd control during major religious holidays, but Pilate kind of wanted to tout his authority and thumb his nose at the Jewish people. So he's like, okay, the soldiers are gonna be in Jerusalem all winter. And then he's like, and they're gonna carry around these shields that have an image of Caesar on them. See, he knew that would really rile up the Jewish people because the Jewish people in Deuteronomy chapter four had a law against graven images. And they took that to mean any replication of the human image because humans are made in the image of God. And so here they are with these shields that are greatly upsetting the Jewish people. And then there were these coins floating around with Caesar's image on them. And you can just see why this is a big problem for the Jewish people. And so the Jewish people were like, okay, the, the shields are just too much. 
And so they did what people do even in 2024 when they get upset about something that happens politically. And this is why I'm really not looking forward to the Wednesday after election, no matter who wins, because I'm assuming that the same thing's gonna happen and people are rioting in the streets. And that's what happened in Pilate's time. And so the people began rioting in the streets against these shields. And Pilate's like, enough of this nonsense. We're not doing political protest. And so he ordered the army to go out into the streets. And he says to the people, go home, disperse, or we're going to kill you. You know what the people did? They called us bluff. They laid down in the middle of the streets and they put out their necks like this, like go ahead and chop our heads off because they knew that Pilate wouldn't want his first act as governor to be a mass execution. And so Pilate backed down and gave in. Well, guess what? Once the Jewish people realized that they could get Pilate to give in, they knew that all they had to do was turn up the heat. A few years later, Pilate got into another political quibble and he'd had enough this time and he actually did order a mass execution. And you know what the Jewish people did? They sent envoys back to Rome, to the emperor. Look what Pilate did. We want Pilate replaced. And they had petitions to get Pilate removed. I'm not sure if they found those on change.org or where, where they got those going, but, but they were like, we don't want him as governor anymore. So it's kind of like strike one, he showed that he could be overpowered. Strike two, they'd already appealed to the governor. And by the way, if Jesus was crucified in 33 AD, which very, you know, possibly might have happened, we believe Jesus was uh, 33 years old when he died. So if historians got it right that Jesus was born in 0 AD, if he was then crucified in 33 AD, um, some interesting things were happening behind the scenes. See, here's the deal about Pilate Pilate wasn't like most governors, he wasn't from the nobility. He was from the equestrian class. So think kind of like the middle class of Rome. And the only reason he ever became a governor is because he had this very powerful mentor who picked him up and trained him and helped him get to a position of power. And that guy's name was Seginus. And so Seginus actually became like the second most powerful guy in Rome. But a few months before the events described here in John 19, Big drama hit in Rome. It was discovered that the reason Seginus came to such power instead of Tiberius's own son is because Seginus had plotted with the wife of Tiberius's son, so the daughter-in-law of the emperor, and they'd poisoned Tiberius's son and killed him to get him out of the way so that Seginus could have all the power. How do you think Tiberius felt when it was discovered that Seginus had killed his boy? Seginus was completely humiliated, killed in some of the most painful ways imaginable in human history. And here's Pilate hanging out over in Israel. The only person that's had my back politically is the guy that just got killed for poisoning the emperor's son. Can't you just imagine that the friend of my enemy is my enemy too? And so don't you think Tiberius would just be looking for any excuse to do to Pilate what he'd done to Seginus just to get rid of all of Seginus's influence and impact around the empire? So when these Jewish people say to Pilate, If you do this, you're not a friend of Caesar. What they're saying is we're going to go tattle on you to the emperor who hates you and probably wants you dead. And if you get this wrong, it's going to give him the pretext he needs to do what he probably already wants to do, which is depose you and exile you and kill you. So how committed do you think Pilate was to the truth? Was he committed enough to risk his own neck? The Jewish people are like, here's the deal. We're going to go to Pilate and say, this guy was an insurrectionist. We convicted him in our own court. We handed him over to Pilate and gave him all the evidence about how this guy was going to stir up people to rebel against Rome and Pilate let him go. 
Pilate did some quick math in his head and he's like, it's his head or mine. What kind of allegiance did Pilate have to the truth? Not much. Pilate immediately went to the place where he would render a verdict and he's like, guilty, boom, send him to the cross. The Jews had pressed the political point so much that Pilate couldn't do anything but give in to the pressure. But Pilate tries to get in one last little dig. He's like, should I crucify your king? Look at your king, beaten, bloodied, bruised, disgusting. Pilate's, this is kind of like the last gasps to insult from someone who knows that they've been beaten. And they respond with the most true words they've ever spoken. We have no king but Caesar. Really? Really? You've been spending the last hundreds of years begging the Lord to return Israel to national prominence? You have been hoping that God would come and bring his own king back to your people? You who have the Old Testament, you have no king but Caesar. What about Zephaniah chapter three, verse 15? The Lord has removed your punishment. He's turned back your enemy. The king of Israel, the Lord is among you. What about 1 Samuel chapter eight? Right before Saul was chosen as king, when the people were like, we want a king like all the nations. And Samuel, the prophet's like, I'm not sure that's a good idea. God's your king. And God shows up in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, and says to Samuel, the Lord uh, said to Samuel, listen to the people, everything they say to you, they've not rejected you, they've rejected me as their king. These people knew that the whole history of Israel was rejecting God as king. And guess what? They just did it again. They should have known better, but they refused because their hearts had been hardened. John's whole gospel has been building up to this point. Remember back in the prologue of his gospel, John chapter one, verse 11, he came to those who were his own and his own did not receive him. This is the full bottom of his own rejecting and not receiving. God sent his son, Jesus, to be king, but his own people rejected and killed him. There's a question of allegiance here. And they, these Jewish people, answered that question for themselves. Is Jesus your king? They said, no, no, no. When push comes to shove, we'll choose the world's way. We'll use the world's power and we'll align ourselves with Caesar as king so that we can get what we want. And friends, the application almost writes itself. Who's your king? See, it's not really, was Jesus the king of these people who lived thousands of years ago? The question is, is Jesus your king right here, right now? When you have to choose between what you want and doing what the world says is good to help you get what you want, when it comes between that or pledging allegiance to Jesus, who do you choose? And, and the question that you might ask is, how do I know if Jesus is my king? And the answer is, people whose king is Jesus act like people whose king is Jesus. If Jesus is your king, you're going to act like subjects of the king. And so if your heart is unchanged, and it's still acting like a worldly heart, like it's still full of hatred and bitterness and gossip and envy and slander and rage and and just all these things. If you're chasing fame and sports and prestige and money and all these things instead of Jesus, if you're regularly breaking your commitments, if if you don't worship Jesus as your Lord when, when when it would cost you something, how can you say he's your king? And so I think John lets this phrase from the Jews hang in the air so that we'll ask ourselves some hard heart questions. 
Who's the king of my heart? Who has my allegiance? But I want to end with a note of good news. Jesus can become your king, even if Jesus hasn't been your king. See these Jewish leaders who called for Jesus to be crucified? There's an interesting note in the book of Acts. On the day of Pentecost, 40 days after the events that happen around the death and resurrection of Jesus, Peter stands up and preaches. And in Acts chapter two, 3,000 people respond to that gospel message. And then in Acts chapter six, verse seven, it begins telling us about the people who are responding to the gospel message. And it includes this line that almost looks like a throwaway line in the book of Acts, just as many priests became obedient to the faith. The religious leaders who stood and mocked Jesus and called for his death because they had no allegiance to Jesus within a couple months were giving their lives over to Jesus. And I say that to say, you can make Jesus your king at any moment, no matter where you've been or what you've done. If Jesus is calling and knocking at your heart, saying, allow me, to be the Lord and leader of your life, you can bow the knee and say, Lord Jesus, save me. I want you to be my king because I believe that you defeated sin and death and Satan on the cross and you can come in and transform my heart and remake my heart so that I can love you forever. God, thanks that Jesus is king. I pray that we as a people would honor Jesus as our King, that we wouldn't just know the story, but that we would experience Jesus in reality as the Lord and leader of our lives. God, be doing your work in our hearts, even in this moment. Show us if our allegiance is truly to Christ. If so, we thank you for what you've done on the cross to be our King. And God, if there are people here who realize, I I don't know that I belong to Jesus, I pray that in this moment, they would say, Jesus, I give you my life. I bow the knee before you as my King. I give you my sins so that you can kill it on the cross. I give you my life so that your spirit can transform it. I want to live for you. I want to become united with you. God, we are so grateful that we can crown you King of kings and Lord of lords, we do that even now. Amen.